welcome. Our first speaker is Kevin, uh, Kevin Greenan. He's one of the uh, very first engineering folks over at Blameless um, who do a lot of interesting things, which he'll tell you all about. Uh, Kevin was previously um, spent a long time at Box where he was a uh, principal engineer and before that spent a long time working on reliability of a slightly different variety than we focus on here. Uh, but for, uh, for now, we'll just go ahead and let Kevin take it away. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as Jacob said, I'm Kevin. Um, I uh, am an engineer, founding engineer at Blameless. Um, I put infrastructure in quotes here because we technically don't have any infrastructure people right now. Um, and I'll kind of go into uh, kind of why I, uh, I say that there. Um, so who am I? Um, I've been working in computer and distributed systems for about 16 years um, professionally now. Um, a bunch of that time was done in research. Um, uh, previous life was mostly spent in erasure codes and reliability engineering. And like Jacob was saying, not the site kind. Um, it was basically mathematical modeling for uh, reliability. Um, worked at a bunch of companies uh, in the research side, IBM Research, HP Labs, worked at a bunch of startups, was at Box um, and EMC before, Blameless, and now um, I'm at Blameless. Um, so th these days I, I mostly just write code. So I, I identify as a software engineer but um, basically out of necessity, I've had to really learn infrastructure and um, stuff more on the operational side of things. Um, so why am I giving this talk? So in the past I have done some opsy things, um, but I wouldn't consider myself to be like an infrastructure ops engineer. Um, and uh, out of necessity at Blameless, since we're a small team, um, we basically needed someone to go set up our infrastructure. Um, I was basically the one that kind of raised hand and, and was chosen to do it. Uh, became the owner of creating quote unquote enterprise ready infrastructure. And I'll kind of go a little bit into what, what at least I think uh, I mean by that. And through the process, I uh, learned a bunch of stuff. Um, <clears throat> one thing I learned was it's not as daunting as I thought it was before I started. Um, I think when I went into it, I thought it was going to be like, it was going to be really hard. It was going to take a really long time and I was going to screw everything up. I probably like, you know, time only tell how bad I've screwed things up, but I at least think what we have now is actually pretty good. Um, and just a lot, of, a lot of great things kind of fell out of um, the patterns and tools we use that actually make not only things on the operational side easier, um, it actually makes some stuff on the development side easier as well, which, which is kind of nice kind of walking into it wearing the development hat and the operations hat, being able to make things better for, for everyone at, at the company. Um, but I think more than anything else, like coming to a meetup, um, I'd really like to learn from people that actually know what they're doing in this and not someone that's just been doing it for like nine months or whatever. Um, so like any comments anyone has, uh, good or bad, um, totally welcome. Um, so just a quick overview. I'm just going to go through our infrastructure goals um, that we had a, a specific to Blameless. Um, uh, kind of walk through what our infrastructure stack looks like now and how we, how we deploy. Um, and then I call them unlock superpowers. So based on the tools that we used, it really did feel like I had superpowers. And in terms of just having a, for instance, having a customer come to us and say, we need um, an instance in the EU and being able to do that within minutes, um, to me feels like a superpower. Because the world I came from, you would have to put an order in and that would take six weeks. And then you'd have a team go rack and stack the stuff. And then you have to make sure you had enough money to go do it. And then there'd be teams who would, and you know involved in setting all this stuff up and then finally you get to use it to being in a world now where it basically a, a touch of a button i can basically have a data center set up with a compute cluster running my application and then with a touch of a button if i feel like it i could basically tear all that down i'm not being charged for it anymore it's pretty I, I, to me it's pretty powerful um i'm going to try to demo a few things like demoing infra is the most boring thing in the world because it's just a terminal window but i recorded some stuff and i think i just want to basically show um, how easy it is with, you know, a couple invocations of a script being able to go from setting up a VPC all the way to running our application on it um, fairly quickly. Um, and then like, I'll, you know, I'll close out kind of going through some idi idiosyncrasies and improvements um, that definitely could be made. Um, so our infrastructure goals, um, there are four main ones. Um, one, uh, this is a term I came up with. I'm not sure if it's a thing or not, but I term it uh, write once, apply many. So it's basically, uh, you know, write the thing once and then make it so that I could just stamp out instances of uh, ba basically our platform um, in any cloud. Um, enterprise ready. So usually to me, enterprise ready means um, private network that's locked down. It's not accessible from the outside. 
and um, the ability to do uh, disaster recovery um, amongst a bunch of other stuff. But to, to us, those were the two big things. Um, for us, since we're a small team, we wanted to be low maintenance. So um, basically trying to use automation, scripting, and templating as much as we can, just so to make it easier on us to maintain the stuff. And then flexible. Our, the, the use cases that we're kind of coming out with presenting to customers is varied. Um, so we're a SaaS solution, but uh, so that that'd be hosted, but we're also doing on-prem for customers. So giving our platform the ability to run within a cluster, uh, like a customer's own infrastructure. Um, there's hybrid cases where we might want to run part of our infrastructure inside of a customer's infrastructure and part in the cloud. Um, so we have to be able to support that and then ad hoc. So ad hoc would be a uh, customer wants a POC, a feature, just being able to easily spin up um, an instant, deploy instance, deploy code to it that wouldn't, isn't in the main master branch to allow customers or even developers to um, be able to, to test and, and play around with. Okay, this is stupid. I couldn't think of a good, like I, like, I couldn't think of anything that could beat LAMP, but I call it the tech of stack. So it's basically how do we, uh, you know, get to where we want to be um, we get it through Terraform, Kubernetes, Helm, and, and Bash, and, and some Python. Um, so just a uh, quick raise of uh, hands, like who uses Terraform on a regular basis? Kubernetes? Helm? Okay. You know, I, I, this makes me feel a little bit better because the last one of these I did, like everyone pretty much had their hands up the whole time. Like, you guys should come up here and tell me what to do. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, actually I met up with Jacob last week and I was talking about this when he kind of saw a lot of the stuff we'd done and he's like, you know, it's really impressive. I don't think what we've done is as impressive as the tool set we have these days. I know it's harder if you're a company that's been around for a long time and you're running stuff for your own data centers and so forth to adopt these things. But being a new company, being able to greenfield this. Kubernetes at this point is stable enough to actually go and deploy and walk into customers with a straight face. So, you know, that wasn't the case like five years ago, because I remember Kubernetes like zeroed out one. It was buggy, nobody trusted it, no one was really using it. It's great. At this point, we have a tool set that allows us to create, the, uh, you know, basically really flexible infrastructure in the cloud. Okay, so this is probably like the, one of the more important slides. I know there's a lot of information here. I'm gonna try to go slowly through it. Um, so this is basically our stack. So if we start at the bottom, um, the, the bottom pieces are basically things that don't change that much. So that's your core infrastructure. So at the very bottom, you have your VPC, basically all your networking, um, IP address management, DNS routing, all that stuff. So that's VPC. Above that, you have all your compute and images. Uh, and then above that, you have um, managed services. So for us, that's going to be managed databases, managed Kubernetes, and so forth. So with those, since those are things that don't change that much, at least for us, um, we uh, use Terraform to manage all that, and it's a human that's basically um, going and actually, uh, and I'll show you as part of the demo, actually invoking Terraform to deploy those things. Um, I got into, I wouldn't say an argument, but a conversation with someone a few weeks ago about this, because I know there's places that use Terraform within their CI pipelines, um, and kind of questioning what our decision not to put in CI. And I think for us, it doesn't really make sense. Like, how often are you standing up a data center? Because that, to us, that's what a VPC is. So it didn't really make sense, but we're still managing all our configs as code within that. Um, so above that, we basically have all the stuff that's managed by Kubernetes and Helm. So at the top layer, you have the stuff that's changing a ton. So th that's the blameless platform. That's all our microservices. And then we have this weird little layer sand sandwich in between. That's our own Kubernetes-based infrastructure layer. So that's basically the cluster level services that are supporting the application. So th this is basically from here down is all managed cloud services. This is the, the blameless infrastructure layer is the stuff that's managed by us in Kubernetes using Helm. So that's your, you know, your ingress resource or your uh, ingress controllers. Twistlock is a separate thing I won't get into. Uh, Cert Manager to manage all the certificates, Grafana, Prometheus, all those things. We manage all those ourselves with, with Kubernetes. And then obviously on the top, we have our application that's managed with Kube and Helm. The top layer is obviously in our CI CD pipeline because it changes a lot. So, I think the only thing I'm trying to get across here is we wanted to make sure that we split things up in such a way that made sense. Stuff that didn't change a lot didn't really make sense to throw into a automated pipeline because we create a new VPC once every six months or something like that. So why would you do that? Um, okay, just quick overview of our current deployments. So um, we're running uh, uh, across four v VPCs, three regions. So we're running across a AWS in most of the regions, so US West and um, uh, in Singapore, 
And then most of our workloads are actually in uh, uh, GCP, uh, US Central. Um, so I, I think all I really wanted to show here is like it, our architecture is set up in such a way that you can have multiple VPCs per region. Um, so for instance, one of these is our dev VPC, one's a prod VPC in US West. And then you could have multiple Kubernetes clusters per VPC. And the reason we want that is, is one for scale. If we decide at some point that Kubernetes clusters are only gonna grow so large, we can stop and just stamp out another cluster. There's also customers for some reason, I still don't understand this, they want their own cluster. But we're like, you're running within AWS. Like, I don't really know that the boundaries aren't that clear. It's not much different running their workloads from within a multi-tenant cluster than their own cluster, but that's fine. We'll let customers do that. Um, and then um, for, you know, dev, test environments, and then the ephemerals. Um, oh, yeah, that's actually one other thing that was kind of interesting to solve for was since pretty much all of our tooling is third-party services. So for a deployment and managing our source code repositories, we use um, CircleCI and GitHub. Um, so since we're on private networks, because we have to be, um, how do you deploy, uh, how do you do, you know, CICD? Um, basically, we just set up jump hosts, at the, uh, basically at the edge of each VPC, and then you set up your circle jobs so they can tunnel through. So you set up a special user that has like almost no privileges except to basically run Helm against a cluster and upgrade it, and that's it. Um, so that, that actually turned out to be pretty nice, You're like getting all that working with having to do too much stuff ourselves. Okay, so... Um, I think one thing that kind of fell out of this, at least in my opinion, like I said before, was I felt like, or we felt like as an engineering team, we had new superpowers. So one example that I gave before was we had a customer in Singapore come to us and basically say, the only reason, the, the only way we will adopt Blameless is if you deploy an instance for us in Singapore. The nice thing was within that day, we were able to deploy that instance. So to me, that, that's like kind of, that's kind of awesome. Like just, just having the ability to do that and go, go back to a customer and be like, done, like it's there. Um, the, the ephemeral is one thing that fell out that actually I really like as a developer. Um, so, you know, uh, a couple examples here. There, we had a big feature going through that required a lot of developers. Um, it was going to take a long time to build. It was risky enough where we didn't want it to be in a mainline branch right away. Um, so, uh, basically, this allows us to deploy an ad hoc cluster that multiple developers can all target changes against without actually impacting anything else. And then once it actually got, becomes stable, you could start merging that stuff into mainline branches. So that's the ephemeral clusters. Ephemeral clusters can also be used if you have a, um, a customer that comes along and isn't super serious yet and just wants to kind of play around with it, we'll spin up an ephemeral cluster. Um, once we, you know, a year down the road, we'll probably have a better way to do it, but at least right now we'll do it ephemeral clusters. Um, and then, like I said before, we've had issues with Google. And um, I, didn't, I didn't put together a demo for this because it would have taken too long. It would have been a little weird. But um, we had, I think it was in June, uh, Google had a, a, a storage outage with one of their SSD layers in US Central. Um, and it basically took out ha like half of our MySQL instances. Um, one of them was just crash looping. So restoring uh, you know, an entire cluster in this setup is relatively straightforward. There's still manual pieces. Again, like part-time team working on this, like once we get critical mass working on this stuff, it's probably going to be way better, but still within a couple of hours, was able to restore the, the, the website. So it was really nice. Um, um, okay. So here's, here's like the super awesome um, demo. Uh, let's see how this goes. So this here, I'm just trying to like go through what it takes to spin up a soup to nut, nuts instance. So the example would be customer from Singapore comes to us and says, we need, we would like an instance in Singapore. Um, it basically just comes down to running three scripts at this point. Um, so the first one is basically just to create the, the VPC. So that, that is basically us auto generating that top level Terraform, um, applying it. Uh, again, like these, these infrastructure pieces is someone basically running the script and saying, yes, this apply looks good. Terraform will go through and do it. Um, creating the cluster again, Terraform, either with EKS or GKE, um, and then deploying the infrastructure layer. So that's a supporting layer. That's Ingress, that's um, Prometheus, like all the supporting layer for the cluster. 
and then uh, creating the, uh, the customer instance. So that's auto generating their home config and then CICD takes care of the rest. That will then basically deploy the blameless applica application to that cluster for that customer um, forever until we delete it. Um, so do we wanna see the video? People let me pause it. So basically what happens is, um, going on here. So it's basically, we auto generate um, the top level Terraform object, run plan, run apply, um, and then it basically goes through, creates all the VPC infrastructure. I mean, again, like it doesn't really matter what this says. It's a bunch of text. It's not like you guys are reading it like, oh yeah, like actually like, I think you got something wrong there. Like it's, um, but I, I think all I really wanted to show was how if you had, once we had all the right tooling set up, how easy it was, you know, basically setting up a VPC is just a matter of just like running this script. Um, let's see, go back. Um, and then the other ones, ephemeral instances, and it, it roughly looks exactly the same. Um, uh, it's, it's a matter of just running a command and it's gonna go out and it's gonna create an instance specifically for a, some purpose. So in this case, um, this is my, my instance I created today. So th this is the blameless product. So I'm able to create that. And then um, I could push a bunch of changes to that instance, test a bunch of stuff out. When I'm done, I just run home delete and it's gone. So going from Minikube to that, to me was a big step because I work on the train a lot. And within a half hour, my laptop would be dead if I was trying to do anything with Minikube. The other problem, and I like at previous companies, I've thought about using Minikube. I think it's a bad idea uh, from a support standpoint because you're running it on your laptop. And if someone has a problem with it, it's near impossible to diagnose what the problem is. Here, if an engineer sets up their ephemeral cluster and has a problem with it, I can just, I can go figure out what the problem is because it's all running in the cloud. Uh, back to slides. Cool. Um, so yeah, like I was saying before, it's not all champagne and roses. Um, it's great, um, but uh, you know, like this required a decent amount of uh, Bash and Python to actually kind of glue all the pieces together to make it easy to use and maintainable. Um, like uh, some of the questions from before, there are differences between the providers and that does kind of become a pain in the butt. I think if you structure your Terraform properly, it makes it a lot easier. And I think we've done an okay job of doing that, at least hiding that away from the top layer. Um, oh yeah, so the, uh, the disparate config between EKS and GKE, someone was asking about IAM. So the whole AWS auth uh, config map um, is kind of a pain to manage, but it's just another thing to manage. There's another weird thing with uh, EKS where you have to tag, if you're running on private networks, you have to tag those networks. Otherwise Kubernetes doesn't function properly. It just like, just seems weird to me. It's just like little weird things they did with EKS. It seems like there's some duct tape in there where I think GKE probably thought through stuff a little bit more. Um, and then like another thing, and I'm not sure if I chose the right pattern for this, but um, since we run in multiple platforms, um, doing DNS to me felt goofy in that, um, Google is our source of truth for DNS, but we also run out of AWS and need to use Route 53. Um, and basically the way we solved that was all of our A records were in Google, and then we just have C names in AWS that would point back so we can use our top level domain. People seem to say that that's like the way to do it. It just seemed not clean to me, but I guess if that's the way, that's the way. Um, there's a lot more, it's a lot more smaller stuff. Um, obvious improvements, I think the biggest thing is, we and we need to, hire a full-time infrastructure and or production engineer to basically own this um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. I really like working on the product. Um, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot working on this. I think I'll continue uh, honing my skill set in this area, but I think my true passion lies in building products. Um, so really want to hand this over to someone that would really be passionate about doing this. Um, and then like, th there's never enough automation. Like we've automated a lot of stuff, but there's still a bunch of manual shit we do. So um, hopefully like whoever joins on to take this on would help like automate the crap out of this stuff. Um, one thing we're actually realizing now is the cloud is super, it can be super expensive. We're really paying attention to our bill a lot now. We're having to like scale back and actually make architectural decisions based on price. So the cloud's nice and convenient, but it comes at a cost. Um, and I uh, still really don't know how to unify, if you have IAM and AWS and IAM and Google, um, a clean way to unify those two worlds. Because again, whenever we onboard a new engineer now, we have to basically create um, identities uh, in both cloud providers. And that's pretty much it.